Bloomberg terminals really bring together all of the data that the financial markets have to offer. And in this video, we're going to show you how to use the terminals to create your own stock report. And even if you just have good old Yahoo Finance, this should still be a really big help to get going with your assignment. The finance industry depends on Bloomberg for reliable, up-to-date data to make decisions on billions of dollars in transactions daily. At Massey, we have a total of 12 terminals located across our campuses, here in the investment room in the Manawatu, and up in Albany in the trading room. For those that can't make it into campus to access a terminal, Bloomberg still have something very helpful for you in your journey in investments. I recently took the Bloomberg Market Concepts course, which is available online in your browser, and I can honestly say this has been one of the most important pieces of revision that I've done in my entire finance study. The course provides both key details, but more importantly, a coherent big picture view of the investment space. Massey students can take the BMC free of charge, but I was so impressed that I think if you're serious about investments, it's probably going to be well worth the $250 USD sticker price anyway. I'll be making a review video of this course, so subscribe to the channel and keep an eye out for that. Now, as we fire up the terminal to gather up all of the data needed to make our stock report, we're going to introduce the two main valuation approaches, intrinsic or absolute valuation and relative valuation. If you take the BMC, you'll learn a lot about these two approaches, but we're going to try to give you a pretty good idea here, and some of these points may be worth mentioning in your assignment. Absolute valuation involves estimating future cash flows of a company and the appropriate rate to discount these at. This discounting is based off the principle of the time value of money, meaning a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow. If we're going to give a company our money by buying its stock, we're going to want more back in the future, normally distributed to us as dividends. The rate to discount these cash flows at is normally the company's cost of equity, which we can estimate using the CAPM or Capital Asset Pricing Model. This gives us an estimate based off the relative risk of the company. We can actually find the company's cost of equity directly on the terminal, but since your assignment may ask you to calculate this yourself to show your knowledge, we're going to quickly go through how to do it here. And of course, everything that you need for the calculation will be available on the terminal. To come up with the all-important beta coefficient for CAPM, we need two matching time series, one for the stock itself and one for its benchmark. This benchmark should be selected carefully, uh, normally based off the market index where the stock is traded. We need the sample period, the start date and end date, the frequency daily, weekly, monthly, and also the currency denomination to match across both of these time series. Sometimes we may need to zoom the chart out to make sure we're getting the maximum available data. To download the data to Excel, we follow this process. It's worth mentioning here that when selecting our stock or stocks to analyse that not only should the companies be publicly traded, but they should also have a decent amount of trading history, say for example 5 years. Now in Excel we need to convert our price history to returns, and at this stage it's really important that we've got the ordering correct. A huge benefit to using Bloomberg versus say for example Yahoo Finance is that we can basically guarantee that all of the values in the time series will be present, meaning that we won't have problems with missing data. A quick tip here is that if you're just using Yahoo Finance and you have one or two missing values, you can probably get away with just copying the adjacent cells down. Using the data analysis tool pack, which you may need to install, we can run a regression of the stock's returns against the benchmark to get our all-important beta coefficient. As one of the remaining variables needed in our calculation, we should select a risk-free rate carefully, normally based off where the company is domiciled, for example, a New Zealand stock, we would generally use the New Zealand government 10-year bonds. And for a US stock, we would use the 10-year US Treasury bonds. There's some debate as to whether to use the raw yield of the bond as the risk-free rate in CAPM or to calculate the return of the series as we would with a stock. You may want to double-check with your course materials as to which approach to use here. Geometric mean returns are the most accurate, but calculating these in Excel isn't exactly straightforward. 
So just using arithmetic means should be fine for your assignment. In the future, I'll have a video on how to accurately calculate geometric means using Excel, so keep an eye out for that. With all the relevant inputs selected, we simply plug these into the CAPM and get our result. This is what we will use to discount our estimated future cash flow for it. Fortunately, Bloomberg provide consensus estimates of important company financial values from analysts who cover the stock. We can find more information about these by searching on the terminal. The particular flavour of dividend discount model to use is up to you as the analyst, with the simplest of these being the Gordon Growth Model. If you're taking a more advanced investments course, you may be asked to separate this out into a multi-period model, where we use one growth rate for say the next two or three years and then one off into perpetuity. The Gordon Growth Model is just the last part of this. Finally, with all of these values assembled, we can plug them into our chosen valuation model. And this will spit out a stock price, which represents our best estimate of the intrinsic value of the stock. From here, the buy-sell decision is simple. If the intrinsic value that we calculate is higher than the stock's current traded price, we buy. And if the intrinsic valuation that we calculate is lower than the current price, we sell. A hold recommendation means that we advise the investor to not change their position in the stock. For example, if they already hold it, it means to not sell. And if they don't own it, it means to hold off on buying for now. A hold recommendation may be most appropriate if we have conflicting good and bad results in our analysis. Here's a good place to demonstrate the massive shortcomings of this valuation approach. For example, if we just adjust our discount rate or growth rate ever so slightly, this may change the investing decision outcome of our analysis. The way to state this is that absolute value calculations are extremely sensitive to changes in the model inputs and also the model inputs are particularly difficult to calculate correctly. Because of the shortcomings of this absolute valuation approach, many professionals prefer to also use another approach. With a relative valuation approach, rather than estimating future cash flows of a company, we take its current valuation ratio such as price to earnings and then we compare these against relevant comparator companies or a relevant benchmark say for example the industry benchmark or the overall market benchmark we can find comparable companies by searching on the terminal you can find these financial ratios in many different places on the terminal for example the summary tables or in the financial statements themselves but in our case, we're gonna use the ultimate hack. We're gonna use the Bloomberg plugin for Excel. This is a particularly powerful approach for comparative analysis because at the same time, we can pull up the valuation ratios of many different companies and put them all into a nice table to compare against. When selecting the best valuation ratios to use, we can look to a 2002 paper by Lee and Lee titled multiples used to estimate corporate value. This paper was the first of its kind to compare and analyze the best valuation ratios. Lee and Lee noted that the demand for this type of comparative study was extremely high because of the prevalence of the use of relative valuation in the industry. The paper can be accessed on Google Scholar by the Massey Library's subscription on any Massey machine or simply by being logged onto a Wi-Fi network. Once we have the suitable valuation ratios assembled, we can determine whether our company is cheap or expensive relative to its comparators or the benchmark, placing the greatest weight on metrics that are best suited to the job. As pointed out by Lee and Lee, normally price to book value assets is going to be a really good valuation metric. Uh, with the exception of a situation when the company has a high proportion of intangible assets. These intangible assets are harder to value than, for example, financials that tend to have very liquid, easy to value assets. And so in a situation with high intangible asset proportion, the price to earnings ratio may actually be more reliable. There are some limitations to this approach though. 
One of them is that there may not actually be any decent comparator companies available to compare your one against. For example, in New Zealand, there may only be one or two companies in the entire industry. And so even the in industry benchmark may not be a useful comparator. We always do have the market benchmark to use though. And even without that, we can still compare the current valuation ratio levels compared with their historic averages for that same company. So there's always some information to be found. We should take into account though that historically some industries tend to be valued higher than the market benchmark or lower than the market benchmark. Perhaps the biggest drawback of this approach is that it relies on the comparator companies and the market index even to be correctly valued. For example, if the whole market is overvalued, it's not very informative to say that our company is undervalued compared to the market value. We hope this has been useful to you for putting your assignment together. Just keep in mind that individual stock valuation is an extremely difficult task. And if you're doing this for your own investment purposes, you're competing with an industry that has near infinite resources to pour into doing this job. So normally individual investors are much better off to simply purchase the market index rather than hold a small portfolio of individual stock. The market index provides a dramatic improvement in diversification. Finally, none of this is intended as investing recommendations or financial advice and so no guarantees are provided and no liabilities are accepted for any losses of any kind. Hi, I'm Aiden. Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm Garth. Hello, I am Bilal. Please consider subscribing to our channel, liking this video, leave a comment with your thoughts or a question down below. Hitting that notification bell is also the best way to keep up to date with these videos to help you on your journey to financial well-being.